welcome to the Emotional Balance Sheet Podcast, your guide to help you manage life, money, and multiples. Each episode, host Paul Fenner, Tama Capital's president and founder, and the proud parent of four amazing children, including one set of triplets, will provide insights on successfully sustaining an active lifestyle, career, and family through comprehensive wealth management strategies, financial education, and lifestyle planning, specific to parents raising twins, triplets, and more. Learn more, subscribe to the show, or connect with Paul at TamaCapital.com. This podcast is for informational purposes only and should not be relied upon for investment decisions. Clients of Tama may retain positions in the securities discussed in this podcast. No matter if you're in a job transition, looking for a new career, trying to grow your business, or simply wanting to expand your knowledge, networking is a skill that should definitely be in your tool set. But how do you network in the age of COVID when most everything is virtual? Terry Bean, a foremost expert in networking, especially within LinkedIn, discusses how to utilize social networks best to help you give and get the support you need and want. The first step of networking successfully is to be intentional about what you are trying to accomplish. Determine what specific solution you are trying to solve, who you know that could help you solve it, and how you reach that person or group. Please enjoy my conversation with Terry Bean. You are known in the community as one of the foremost leaders in networking. I guess both back in the day in a a physical presence and now in a virtual presence. And you're also known very well in the LinkedIn community. So those are the areas that I really want to focus on on today. Um, Let's talk about this transition from going to, to networking from actually going to seeing people to virtual. Um, walk us through like what that transition's been like for you and the organizations that you've been a, that you've been a part of, and and how that's just going. <laughs> you know, it's been a it's been a fascinating transition. The reality is, as you alluded to, I started doing online networking and air quotes for those of you who are listening back in 2006, right? So even before there was video chat like you and I are doing right now to record this. So moving from a from a belly to belly kind of thing to a pixel to pixel kind of thing has been in my DNA for 15 years at this point. Um, so the transition was relatively easy. The, the challenge with it is just because I got a head start doesn't mean that everybody else did. So it's, uh, there's some laggards and in any time there's a switch or a movement, you got to try and catch those people up to where you are. Um, and while the technology is pretty easy to use, uh, there's also some challenges with how easy it is for other people to get into it, you know, with the famous Zoom bombs and the crazy things that are happening. For me, it, uh, I was pretty selective. You know, when we got, when we started this, I was still doing MCC Live or Motor City Connect Live meetings, which was bringing random people from the community together for a specific networking event. And in March of 2020, I had my friend Paula Ruffin, also a Club MCC member with us, Paul. Um, I had her do a presentation. And as I was laying in my COVID bed, because that's where I was doing some of those early meetings up in my up in the li- in the bedroom, because my wife had taken over the living room, um, I thought this is it. I'm not doing another random online networking, just bringing a bunch of people together. I'm going to double down and focus my energy on the people that are closest to me in my tribe. And so I kind of eliminated some of that superfluous networking out of my world. Uh, that wasn't super intentional or where I wasn't invited by people that I know uh, to a group where there were people that I wanted to get to know. So I, I kind of went the, the other direction. What, that's did, really, what did you end up doing? Well, that's really interesting because just before we started hitting the record button, you know, you and I worked together several years ago. And one of the things that you were constantly on me about with Tama is get more specific, get more intentional. And it took a while to get there, admittedly. Um, I should have gotten there faster. Um, but that's, I, I've taken that approach. And I'm really glad that you kind of forced me into that. 
and it's not to say I, d- I don't go back and, and explore different, you know, avenues with, you know, businesses and 401k, you know, clients again, but I think where I'm needed most and, and where the most interest lies is in the family office side. Um, mm. But again, to your point, when, when the whole COVID thing hit, like I started getting bombarded, like in the financial service industry where I'm at, you know, I could be on a a networking or a webinar, you know, several times a day. And while the information was great, it was often overwhelming. And so you had to really skinny it down and figure out, okay, where am I going to get the best, best value for me? So then I can pass that value onto my, my families that I work with. And, you know, I think zoom fatigue is a real thing and it's, it's made me even more intentional when I put something out to my, my families that I work with or with prospects is that I want to make it really intentional. Like I want to make sure that I'm covering something really specific that's relatable and relevant to them. That's so important, right? The, the reality is there's so much information and everybody became an information expert over the last year or so. And, and it's so easy to grab a, to grab a stage, to grab a mic and to, to build an audience around you. Uh, and so we can get really lost And you know, you and I see each other on LinkedIn from time to time, certainly more than we see each other in person anymore. Um, I created a mantra probably, I don't know if it was early April or late March, but, uh, and it was, it was just three thoughts and they were really, really simple to me. It was keep your head down keep your chin up and keep moving forward, right? So that that mantra really served me well. Keep your head down, right? Stay focused on the shit that matters. Don't go squirrel. Don't go Tiger King. Don't go 87 new businesses, right? Get, get really, really dialed into where you want to go and keep moving toward that, you know, and that's the keep moving forward part. And then that keep your chin up piece is we were inundated with negative news man anytime you start hearing about a, a, a infectious disease where people are going to die you know you're going to get pounded with that information on the daily and holy cow i, I wonder i wonder how many times covid or covid19 or the vid or the the rona whatever I wonder how many times that was mentioned in the last 12 months and here's a word that we really never used outside of a crappy beer from mexico and, and now it's like the most common phrase on the planet, you know, it's, uh, it, we're, we're, we're smashed with it at this point. And there's, and, and I remember those early days where, you know, Teresa and I, my wife, Teresa and I would be watching the news and I just have to turn it off. Like there's only so much you could take and same way with being online, whether it was Facebook or LinkedIn or any of the social media platforms, you know, it was always right there in, in your face. And sometimes, you, you just needed to take a, a break and, and step back from it because it would you know, drive you nuts, especially with what I do in the, in the markets. When, you, when I look back in, in March, when things were just cratering. Um, but it, the, the interesting about that is that the families I work with, I think I never received one call from a panicked client about what's going to happen. Um, and I think it's just because of the constant education that I've done throughout the years to to help people realize, okay, this isn't uh, a risk-free environment. You know, you're, we're going to have ups and downs, and but over the long, long term, you know, the the tra- trajectory is is up, and you know, this is you know how people achieve a lot of their you know lifestyle and financial goals. So, you know that that piece didn't bother me, but I I was very cognizant of you know how people feelings were about the market. So I would send out, you know, information every, you know, couple of weeks. And, and the, the best thing I did, I think was, I didn't tell people not to panic. If you wanted to panic, panic all you want. But that's where I come in where like, I'm not going to let you make an emo- a, a negative emotional decision when it comes to, you know, your wealth management plan or your portfolio. Um, so you, when you were, when you had Club MCC, and we'll link to this in the show notes, you know, you would have this once a month 
and you'd get anywhere from what 40 to 60 people, sometimes more than that. Yeah. And Motor City Connect, right? So Club MCC was an offshoot of Motor City Connect and, and yes. those Motor City Connect meetings were MCC live. And yeah, we'd have uh, like in the last couple of years, seeing 40 people in a room was, was like, if it wasn't 35 or 40, it was like, Oh, what happened? Did I forget to tell people why, why is there only 30 people here? You know? And so those meetings had really seen a resurgence in the last, in the last couple of years, you know, I think what happened over time is in the, in 2010, 2011, 2012, we as a people really started seeing the power of connectivity and looking at how we can connect with people all over the globe and, and Facebook could keep us dialed in the people in California or Alabama or, you know, Abu Dhabi if we wanted to. And same with LinkedIn and same with Twitter and Instagram as well. And over time, I think what happened is, you know, much like we got Zoom fatigue, I think we got a little bit of social media fatigue. And we started realizing that, great, we're making all these connections, but how many of these people are really impacting our bottom line? We probably need to focus on our own market, focus on your niche, but focus. And when I look at niches, I always think about your industry specific and your geographical specificity, right? And so when you can do geolocal networking inside of your industry uh, specific niche, you're probably going to win. So an avenue like Motor City Connect was where there's thousands of people that are already connected throughout the Detroit area, whether we're on LinkedIn or on the MotorCityConnect.com platform, um, it made it really easy to go out and find people that might be your ideal fit. So local networking became a, a thing again. And, and then when the, when the vid hit, um, then, then online networking became basically the only thing. It's like uh, I was I was talking about having a cigar smoking event with a couple of colleagues. I don't even I, like I can't even really call them friends, right? There, there's one of them's a friend, and there were a couple of colleagues. And you know, it's like the the wife of the guy who was going to host. It's like, well, I know him, but you don't even know these other three people. They're not coming over to our house right now. Forget about it. And you think about it, right? Networking's like uh, in the in the 60s, we had free love. In the 2020s, we have free networking and it's super promiscuous, right? If I network with you, I'm networking with all the people you've networked in the last two months with. I don't know if I can do that. Yeah, that, that's that's very interesting. I mean, that's, that's the premise of the network effect, right? Mm -hmm. That's exactly it. It is. And so if you're, if you're practicing safe networking, it's okay. But if you're practicing <laughs> unsafe networking, yeah, I'm like, I'm now I'm thinking about going to Canva and I've got like this whole little <laughs> digital representation of this joke. So I can't, I can't wait. Maybe I'll send it to you and put that in the show notes. Too. Yeah. So, so from, for, to transition to the, the club MCC, I want to talk about a little bit that, um, cause I'm a member and that's actually been really beneficial for me because of some of the members that are, that are in the group that um, we rely on each other, both from a, a professional standpoint and a social standpoint. So how did, how did you end up coming up with that idea? And then two, how has how, how is the intention of Club MCC grown? Is it, is it where you want it to be today or how do you see it in the future? Those are great questions. So I, I, I have thought about having a, uh, let's call it a professional or structured networking organization for a long time. Motor City Connect was, uh, I never referred to it as a business. I always refer, referred to it as a gift to the community, right? I wanted to help people get better connected. That was the goal. Motor City Connect achieved that. Um, but it wasn't, there was no recurring revenue, whether annual or monthly. Right. If it was a business, it, it, it failed uh, from a business plan perspective. Right. Um, but it was it wasn't. It was a community driven organization. So but I wanted a business side to it. I wanted to give people a little more. I, I've got all this knowledge and I was hoping Club MCC would help uh, facilitate some of that from my head into the written word in the video format in this training. Um, 
So those are things that are still coming. But it really started because Jeff Clatterbaugh, who's also a member and a super mortgage guy over at Independent Bank, um, I don't remember if he shamed me into it or talked me into it or uh, strong armed me into it, but he he had heard me talking about it enough, and he finally said, you know, put your money where your mouth is, Bean. Go go build it. It's people will come, people will show up, and so we did, and and they did, and you know where we are today versus where I think I'd want to be. You know, we I I took basically 2020 off from a growth plan for it because. You know, who who knew those between between March and let's call it August, we didn't even really know what end was up, at least in the state of Michigan. Um, and it and it changed, right? And it's still changing and it's still evolving. So I see I see 2021 being a year of some growth for it, but it's different, right? It's not anyone can come in here. It's not a group for all the people, right? I want, this isn't beginner networking 101. I want people that understand the value of giving time, energy, resources of their network, right? Um, I don't want it being like, hey, what can you give me? What can you give me? This isn't MCC Live. This is, you know, like uh, I, at one point I said MCC now stands for making conscious connections, right? So it's like a next level mental process. And it's not going to be for everybody and nor does it need. To. So, so what, it, it, what, what is, what would be like the, 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 the best fit for somebody um, that would be for like, like a club MCC or any networking group, I, I guess, overall, like how, how do you figure, how does, should somebody figure out what group is best from them, both from what they can provide to the group and what then they can get get back from the group because it's to your point i think this it's all about give or what do i get what do i get what do i get versus what can i give 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 and you know i i learned that when when i was going through a job transition 5 years ago and that was uh, somebody gave me the book the the go giver um mm-hmm. and that was that was an eye opening you know read and it's like the more that you help give, typically it'll come back to you, you know, twofold. Yeah, I actually, I actually count Bob as a Bob Berg, who is one of the co-authors of that book. I count him as a friend and a mentor. I mean, like I've literally sat down and had coffee with Bob on more than one occasion and we live 1500 miles apart. Uh, so that's a super duper book. And I highly recommend to anybody interested in that we can pick up a copy. You know, but you asked a really important question. How do you pick a group, whether it's online or in the real world, that's going to be right for you? So for me, the criteria are, are there people that are calling on the same decision makers that I'm calling? Right. Can I form a subgroup inside of this group? It doesn't have to be 100 percent of the group is going after the same people. It can be 20 percent. Right. Are there five people that I can form a real partnership with that we can actually share leads, referrals, opportunities, databases, contact lists, whatever you want to call it. But are they going to be able to help me set up some meetings? And more importantly, am I going to be able to help them do the same? Because it starts there. If I can't give you something, your interest in giving me something is going to go down considerably, right? So we've got to have that reciprocity thing going. Two, do I like these people? Do I trust these people? And do I want to get to know these people, right? And to me, that's probably even before the the first thing, right? If you can't build that no like, and trust piece, the, the rest of it doesn't even matter. Um, you know, in, in three, are they, what are their rules? And do I want to fit into that? You know, the reason Motor City Connect exists, it even started is because I didn't like how BNI was structured. I didn't like the construct of having to network every week at seven or seven thirty AM. And if I don't show up and I miss three times, they can kick me out. Right. I didn't want to be in a situation where I was forced to write leads that may or may not be good, which means I'd be forced to receive leads that may or may not be good. 
I want to network with adults who are interested in being there, interested in serving other people, not forced to do those things. So that's why that's why Motor City Connect even started. Well, that and the building the confluence of the online networking with the with the real world. Well, you just you just answered the question I was going to bring up is is how that's different th- than BNI because BNI is probably the most widely known you know of the. I guess, physical networking groups. I don't know how they do it today with, with uh, being virtual, but I think you just nailed those three points. So let, let's transition into probably the, the topic that'll take us the rest of the conversation, which is really where you're known um, as an expert is LinkedIn. And specifically, I want to kind of break LinkedIn into maybe four different segments, and maybe you'll have more than these. But when I look at LinkedIn, I want to look at it or want to, I want to have a conversation with you about, you know, somebody that's in job in a job transition, um, somebody that has a job but looking for a new career, somebody that's in a business that wants to use that platform to, you know, get their word out or whatever that may be. And then fourth is wanting to just expand your network. Um, so I'm not looking for you know, for a new job. Um, I'm not, I don't have a business. I just want to, I just want to connect with interesting people um, and provide, you know, gain additional knowledge. So if we can maybe start there and, and chime in, if you, if there's one I missed or something else that, that, that we can talk about at the end, but why don't we start with probably the first and foremost one, which is job transition. So if I'm looking for a job, What's, what are some of the key tips that I should be utilizing LinkedIn? So these are, this is a great question. One, my first tip, because I just received her book, Social Media Pie, is go follow Brenda Mellon. Right? Agreed. Brenda, Brenda <laughs> may, um, I, won't, I won't admit to ever saying this, but Brenda may be a better LinkedIn trainer than I am. She's actually a better marketer than I am. I will. I have written that down publicly. She may be a better LinkedIn trainer. I'm not sure, but she might be. No, she's awesome. Gives great tips all the time. She actually does a job forum for job seekers. I believe it's Friday mornings, at least it used to be. So, and she's real sincere about helping job seekers. So that's tip one. Tip two, and, and more importantly, is there's some things on your profile that you absolutely have to do. One, make sure that you've got a professional current photo, right? And so put that up there for sure. Two, make sure that you have a headline that says you're looking for an opportunity. Now, this is a caveat if you are at a job looking for a better job and you don't necessarily want people to know that, don't follow advice number two. But in any way, shape, or form that you're open to finding work, and I know a lot of people are in between opportunities, you should put hashtag O-N-O in your headline. O-N-O stands for open to new opportunities, right? So people know that you're looking. Don't be ashamed that you're looking for new work. Don't let that bother you. Your job is to find a job. You have to do all the things to do that. So use these resources, right? Number three, and this should really be number one, get specific about what you want. We talk about having an elevator pitch or a 60-second commercial. You need one of those for your job search. People say, well, I'm just looking for work or I'm looking for a job. BS. If you were just looking for work or just looking for a job, there's 87 retail stores or restaurants that are hiring right now. You would have a job. You are looking for a specific career. Tell us what that is. Listen, there are a ton of people that want to help you, but they can't unless you tell them how. So figure out what you're asking. You look like you got a point to say. Well, I think from, from being specific, and I learned this from um, Rich Spriegel when I was going through my transition, is that you need, and we've, I don't know how many times we've said this word already, intentional. I, I encourage people, take some time, think about it. Especially like if, I know my very first podcast episode, I had Scott Capeller on, who um, is a friend of mine. Um, you'll appreciate this. He has a set of triplet daughters. And so 
he got a call, you know, when he was actually in another city that he was being let go. And within minutes, he was on with recruiters and reaching out to people. And, you know, it's, and I'll link to this in the show notes as well. He wrote this, you know, manifesto, if you will, about all the things that he did wrong. And then how, you know, some of the things he ended up doing right. But one of them was somebody told him like, dude, how long have you been looking? It's like 15 minutes. (laughs) Like you need to take some time. You need to take some time and figure out, but it's, it's scary. I remember, I remember going through that five, you know, a little over five years ago. And it's, it's scary, especially when you have a family and young kids like I do. Um, you, you, it's just that fear kicks in and, and you don't probably allow yourself the time that you really need to, you know, decompress and then really figure out, okay, what is it that I want to do next? What can I do next? Maybe what do I have to do next? So all of those are, are really, really important. You know, I've got one of, I've got a whole series of beanisms, but one of my favorites and one of the first ones was, you know, you found your true calling when not only do you love what you do, but people are happy to pay you for it. Right. So think about the intersection of what I love to do. What am I great at? What do people spend money on? Right. So how do you, if you look at it as a Venn diagram, how do I overlap those three things? Love to do, great at, people will pay me for. Um, And then, so think about it from that perspective, because that's the vocation side of it. But then get really specific, right? And be intentional. How do you want your boss to be? Where do you want this location? Right? What type of industry? What do they actually do? What's their corporate culture like? And, and so from a, from a universal law perspective, the clearer and more specific you get on those things, the more likely they are to manifest into your life. And so it, your, your friend's advice or your, the lesson your friend learned about being intentional is so spot on and he probably didn't even know why. But the, the challenge or the opportunity is when you end up that clear on what you're looking for, um, the universe just puts people in your path to make it happen. Like legitimately, I want this. And then one of the next 10 people you meet are the catalyst for making that happen. But if you're like, well, I just want a good job. Nah, it doesn't work that way. You're the people that end up sending 4,000 resumes into applicant tracking systems and wonder why no one ever hears or calls you back. Right. That's the right. other piece of advice. If you're sending pieces of information through LinkedIn, you'd better do yourself a favor of figuring out who's in that company that you can reach out, boom, right? And set that stage, grease that skid, as it were, before just sending things out randomly. Because it's not, it's not going to help you. You just end up in the, in the computer database somewhere. Make so let's, personal connections. let's transition to the next segment, if you will. So that would be a person that already has a career or a job, but is looking to do something different, looking for a new, new business or new company to work for, um, you know, a new career along that lines. It's not, they're in panic mode where I got to get a job. They already have a job. They just want to, you know, do something different, maybe advance their career. Mm. So LinkedIn does a great job of showing you positions that are available, right? So use their job search function. Um, And then also, if you want to use Indeed or other platforms similar to that, figure out who is inside the company, right? So you find a job that you like, whether it's Indeed or Monster or wherever people find jobs these days. Um, Go to LinkedIn, search the company, find the person who you think is the hiring manager or someone in human resources, then look to find somebody that's connected to that person. Again, it's such a relationship thing at this point. All you have to do is do a little bit of outreach. Now, here's the trick, and this is true for business development and for job searching. It is not, it is not out of the question to find a person inside of LinkedIn and then go over, find a phone number, and then just call the person, right? You don't have to do everything through LinkedIn. 
you can actually go old school and pick up a phone and make a call, right? And that's going to set you apart from all the other people. And in this type of job market, you know, and the job market's actually still okay, all things considered. I know a lot of people have lost jobs. Oh, there's probably not as many, but it's still okay. Um, you've got to do what you kind of separate yourself. Voice to voice is still going to beat pixel to pixel, right? So you got to separate yourself. So I would, I would use that, uh, like we used to use the yellow pages in the eighties, man. <laughs> That's that would be a piece of advice. You remember the yellow pages, Paul? You're old, dude. Yeah, yeah, I'm I'm old enough. I think they still get delivered to our house once a year. Um, amazing that they're still in existence. Um, all right, so let's uh, let's transition to the third segment, which is I'm a business owner. How do I? What are some of the best um, tactics to use on LinkedIn to get noticed or to get my message out and be engaged? So I, you, you just hit on a major word there with the word engaged. And I'll touch on that in a second. If I don't say, hey, what about engaged? Um, number one, in the first, the first thing that we need to do, obviously, is fill out the profile, right? That's, uh, I tell people all the time, LinkedIn exists for two reasons. It's to find the people you want to find and be found by the people you want to find you. And so your profile, right, with the right keywords, with the right information, with the right structure to it is super duper important. Um, I don't know if I have, I probably have it linked on the web somewhere. Um, I'll send some, I'll send the 21 tips for making a magnetic profile and you can put it in the show notes so it'll help people get a little clearer. But beyond the profile, it's all content, right? It's all content. And I, I've said for, Ever content is king. That saying's been around for a decade plus. Now it's also about context, right? I said no, content needs to move over. Context is king. So what we really need to do is come up with a content strategy that's going to show people who we are, what we're about, why they care, and what we can actually do for them. And so the more we're actually being in front of people, so some level of consistency. And I will tell you that daily is probably the bare minimum. I don't think you need to go three times a day on LinkedIn, but you probably need to be there daily and you need to figure out when your audience is there. For me, if I post at 7.50, 7.55 in the morning, I'm going to get the greatest reach throughout the day. Every once in a while, I can throw something up in an evening. If I hit it at the right time, either nine o'clock at night or in between nine and 10, something might take off because people are scrolling before they go to bed. But for the most part, right before 8 a.m. really works for me. But that content has got to talk about those things, who you are, what you do, why they care. And it's got to relate to your brand. So you really need to think about that brand strategy and how you're going to put yourself out there. Now, it's one thing to put yourself out there. How do you get people to actually see it? Well, my secret for getting more engagement is being more engaged. So I always talk about the five, five, five rule, right? Spend five minutes, go on five different posts, drop a comment on each that has at least five words in it because that kicks off LinkedIn's algorithm. So great post is not the answer. This was a great post actually has some value to it. So you got to make sure you got the, you got the five word thing going. What it is, it's five minutes, man. Just go add some insight. And again, the more you put into a comment, the better off you are. If you strategically put a comment on the right person's post, it is likely that more people will see your comment than they would see on your post, depending on how big their network is versus how big your network is. So five, five, five. Okay. Um I guess that would be, that would leave us into the last segment where I'm just somebody that wants to network. I'm not looking for, I'm not, I, I have a job. I'm not looking for to change a job or a career. I don't have a business. I'm just using it to get smarter. Where do I go from there? 
So, and this ties into all three of the things. There's a thing on LinkedIn, and unfortunately, they, they kind of buried it over the last five years, and it's trying to make a resurgence, but it's called groups, right? So Facebook has groups, LinkedIn's had groups forever. Um, and so, unfortunately, people use it as kind of a drive-by posting technique. They come in, they drop their post, they leave, and they go into the next group, and they drop their post, and they leave, and they do that over and over and over again. But if you're in a group, and mo- normally these groups are designated by industry, right, or they're designated by geography, so you can go find thought leaders in your space that are posting information that you can consume. You can go in and drop information in front of a group of people that have some sort of affinity for one another that they can consume. I use that engagement rule, right, that 555 engagement rule in groups specifically, because somebody's going to get a notification that you comment on their post. And then if you post after that, they're going to be, Oh, Hey, what did they have to say? You know? So that's kind of, we get real curious about what people are saying or talking about when they're talking about us. We don't care if they're not, it's, it's a, it's psychology one on one, folks. So it's the groups becomes a real powerful thing. Um, the other thing that I end up doing is I tell people that I'm, I'm open to connecting with new folks, right? It's amazing. You go drop a, a post in a group. Hey, I'm really looking to grow my network with people like X, Y, and Z, and then describe the people that you think are in the group, you know, feel free to send me an invite. I accept all comers. You, you start getting invites, right? It's crazy to me how promiscuous folks are on LinkedIn. I love it. You know, I used to tell people all the time, you've got to figure out what your networking philosophy is because you can be an open networker or a closed networker. An open networker is somebody like myself. I firmly believe that opportunities can come from all kinds of different connections and may require new connections, right? Whereas a closed networker believes I can only really network with people that I already know, like, and trust. The difference is you're going to say to me, hey, Terry, how well do you know Dave Nelson? And I'm going to say, I don't know Dave Nelson at all, but I'm happy to make an introduction for you. It's not my job to say whether Dave's going to connect with you. Whereas somebody that's a closed networker would be like, I I don't know you. I'm not making any sort of introduction to any of my network. So neither are right, neither are wrong. If you get a referral from me to somebody I don't really know, I don't have any juice. You get a referral from someone who's a closed networker who's really tight in their network, it's like a, a much higher probability of closing because they're they're like actual real friends and stuff. So given the 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 large, vast network that you have on LinkedIn, and I've I've heard this from other people, and I experience this um, you know, all the almost on a daily occurrence, like I'll get these for lack of a better term, like spam messages for people. Like I, I, I know that somebody's connecting with me just because they want to sell me something. Mm-hmm. And sometimes I'm willing to say, okay, I'm going to accept that, that person's invite because there may be a potential, as you just mentioned, down the road where you know, we could work together. But probably eight, nine times out of 10, it's, it's not. So how do, you, how do you address that? And I guess it kind of goes back to the either you know, open networker or closed networker. It depends on my mood. Um, sometimes I just ignore them, right? And so let's, to give some context around this, I get two to five of those every single day, right? So I don't get like a lot, but I get a lot, right? Relative to people that I talk to, there are folks that don't get that many in a week. I get that many every single day. And so you know, there are days when I will engage. There are days when I'll ignore. There are days when I'll, you know, I rarely make fun. It depends on how body and chat body the thing is. Sometimes I'll game it a little bit, but I don't really have time for that or I don't make time for that. I guess I have all the time in the world. Um, And once in a while, I'll be like, all right, let's chat. You know, if I genuinely think it's something that might help, Right. If they set their chat bot up properly, I'm in a I'm in a role as a vice president of sales for an insurance company that people are actually selling insure tech software. People are selling lead generation for insurance agencies. So I'm easy to find. And if they think they can 
if their messaging's right, and I look at what they've done in the past, um, I'll I'll set up some meetings from time to time because you know part of my job is to grow the company. So if you've got an idea on how to do that better than I do, uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna want to learn. I want to listen. You know, I, I haven't hired anybody from it yet, but you never know. You never know. So as we kind of come to the end of the discussion on networking and and LinkedIn. You know, how I came to know you is actually going, going back to, to, to Brenda Meller. Um, we had connected, gosh, it's 21 already. Um, I don't know. I think we've been, we've known each other for three or four years now at least. Mm-hmm. And, and that's how I got to know you is through a coaching relationship. And talk about, you know, your, your, your coaching business, your coaching style, like who, who's the type of person that would benefit most from, you know, working with somebody like you and, and it could be, and they could come to you for probably a lot of different reasons. They don't just have to be a business owner. Like I am, Um, you know, they could be somebody that's new to LinkedIn that really needs help or wants to learn how to, to utilize it as a tool or any social social media platform for that matter. I, I work really well, Paul, with people that are like you, right? That are overachievers that are like can take on the entire world that have a seventh gear, right? You know how you, I look at uh, old cars. We used to have that, like if it was super fast, it had a six speed manual transmission, right? I talk, I like people that have that seventh speed, that, that one extra gear. Um, and, and the reality is because it's, they tend to need a little bit of focus and they tend to need a little bit of a kick in the ass and they tend to need a little bit of, no, I love where your head is and you're absolutely right. And you can do all of this, but if you don't do it in this order, you're not going to get there. And the only reason I can do that well is because that's who I am, right? I'm a guy that's got grandiose plans. Tony Robbins said it best. People often underestimate what they can do in a decade and they overestimate what they can do in a year, right? So people like you and I- I remember a, you telling me that like three years ago. Because <laughs> it's, it's, it's so true, right? We have we have 10-year vision, but one-year timeline, right? And it's yeah. we, we, we need to have a 10-year timeline in one-year vision, right? We're, 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 just, we're just a little out of phase, right? And so I, I use the phrase all the time, right? It says, it's two clicks on the thermostat, right? It, it's crazy how different it is in your house if you move it from 71 degrees to 73 degrees, right? And, and if you don't believe me, ask your wife. She will <laughs> tell you for sure. So it's one of those things about really working with people. And it's crazy because I've helped folks solve business growth challenges. I've helped them solve marketing strategy challenges. I've helped them solve operational challenges staffing challenges, right? Because I'm, what I really do well, and I'm sure I use this line with you, is I hold the mirror up. I help you see exactly what you want to see and where you need to go. Um, And I do that in a way that really helps propel folks forward. And that is my goal every single time. So that's what works really well. Well, I think that is a, is a great lead into my, my final question that I ask all my guests is, um, I know you have one daughter, so what is the best thing about being a parent? Best thing about being a parent is that you can take a look at your body of work and, and hopefully guide them away from the mistakes that you've made <laughs> and, and give them a little better path. Um, in all sincerity, man, it's seeing the world through somebody else's eyes that you've never, like, I didn't know love until I had that kid, right? I thought I did, but it's not even, it's not even the same level of, of all of it. So being able to experience all these things anew with, with your child, through your child is is utterly amazing. Well, and, and you're about to ready to go through, I think one of the, the big underestimated trend life transitions is your daughter's a senior this year and is going to be going off to college next year. And that's, that, that can be a, a 
challenging transition for, for some people. Um, some, sometimes it's good. Sometimes it's, it's difficult. So it's, I, I think you, you hit it right. You know, nailed, nailed it as usual, um, with, with your answer there. Seven months, man. I was looking at the email yesterday, seven months to today is the last day we can move her into Grand Valley state. So it's crazy to me. Yeah. It's, it, um, somebody told me when I, when I, I, for one of the first pe- people I told that I was, I was having triplets 10 years ago that said, be careful because the days are long, but the years are short. And that's the truest truism I've ever heard. And most parents, like when you say that, it's like, yep, I, yep, I get it. It's unbelievable, man. Like, where did that time go? So, yeah, I'm with you 100%. So, best place for people to find you, obviously, LinkedIn, Terry Bean. And then do you still have trybean.com? Yep, that still exists. You know, um, I'm not even technically, I've been at pkig.com now for four months, but I've never uploaded my image or my bio yet. <laughs> I'm like under the radar. Um, I think it's, I think this is probably home though for a while. So I, I could probably make that change. Um, but the reality is, yeah, trybean.com is tons of info and blog posts and some videos and tips on networking and how to order a book on networking if anyone's so inclined. Um, you know, LinkedIn is a great place to find me. I'm on Facebook. Uh, Facebook.com trybean is my, is my business page. Terry Bean's personal. I'm a little less open to connecting with people there anymore. Um, try being on Instagram. So I'm, I'm all the places. Just don't, don't type in Terry Bean and not have the Detroit thing because there's a Terry Bean out of Oregon that did bad, bad things. <laughs> Just like you, Terry Bean out of Oregon. You are not me. Well, Terry, I can't, uh, I can't thank you enough for the time um, and all the insights. I'm, I'm sure that the audience is, there's a lot of good takeaways and I, I can already envision the, the show notes being very long with a bunch of resources uh, from, from you in, in this conversation. So thank you very much for being on the Emotional Balance Sheet Podcast. Really a pleasure. Thanks for having me, Paul. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Emotional Balance Sheet Podcast. Please visit TamaCapital.com to subscribe to this podcast or to connect with certified financial planner and registered investment advisor, Paul Fenner of Tama Capital. And please join us again next time on the Emotional Balance Sheet Podcast. Mm-hmm.